go to Tim with this idea? Well, I um, was working at the time on, on a show called Tyrant that I created, and um, I wanted a partner on Dig, and I've been a huge fan of Tim. Um, funny enough, now that I know him and worked with him, I'm even a bigger fan of his. Um, and I just thought he would be perfect for this because we tell stories from different point of views and they all converge and, and Tim does that brilliantly. Um, and we, and I met him and I met other people too, but the minute I met him, it was, you know, we're so much in sync about how to tell a story and, and, uh, uh, what we like and our sensibilities that it's really, a a match made in WME heaven. <laughs> I wanted, I was, I really wanted to ask this to Regina, but she, actually you probably can answer this. Um, you like to have strong female characters. Absolutely. In your, and your ambassadors seem to be women. How many am, female ambassadors do we have, do you know, in the world? I don't, but I've met some very, uh, amazing strong ambassadors, the ambassador to the UN is, I think her name is Powers, um, uh, the American ambassador, is an amazing woman I've seen. Uh, I had dinner with her, actually. Um, and in Prisoners of War, I actually invented a female prime minister for Israel. So yeah, I think I think that's those things are very cool. Um, yeah. Can you talk about your, more of it. your selection of Regina for the role? Well, Regina's name came from the studio. And uh, um, it's been a while since she agreed to do anything on television. And we thought she's just fantastic, and um, I was really hoping she would say yes. Um, it was a long shot because she's, she moved to Chicago, and she's, she's I thought, took a break from Hollywood and has been doing a lot of stage work there. And, um, and I still remember her from The Negotiator, which I think she did an amazing role there. Um, so then we met with her, and Regina has something about herself that is so regal and so dignified that she out, she honestly scared both Tim and me. We were like, well, what do we ask her? She's just the ambassador, what can we do? Um, so we loved her and, and it's been a joy working with her. Well, who is Ruth Rydell? I mean, we couldn't get quite a description of what that character's supposed to be in this story. Well, she's the ambassador, uh, the, Amer the American ambassador to Israel, which is a very, very high ranking uh, foreign service officer. Um, you usually get this job if you are either very well connected or if you have worked so hard and very, very smart. Um, that's Ruth Rydell. She got um, to where she is on merit, um, and she's a very tough and yet very warm woman. So. Can you talk she about how... get along too well with uh, Anne's character? Well, the, the, Anne's you know, one of the things that I've learned when we started studying this, I've met with the um, legal attaché in Israel. And he said the hardest thing for a legal attaché is he really has two bosses because he's an FBI guy. So he's got the head of the bureau and he's got the ambassador. Both are his bosses. And many times those agendas contradict because the FBI says, go follow the suspect, and the ambassador says that's going to cause damage with the host country, so don't. So that conflict between Regina and Lynn, both very strong women, um, is part, it's a very big part of the show. Can you talk about how your personal experience living in Israel informed this series? Well, in, in you know, it informs everything I do, but definitely dig, because it's an archaeological thriller based in Jerusalem, and I was born and raised in Jerusalem, and I am in love with that city. Um, it is a city that means everything to so many people around the world. So many people that, be, by the way, haven't even been to Jerusalem. The, the, the term Jerusalem means a lot. We study about it, we learn about it. It's Sunday school or it's the synagogue or whatever it is, the mosque. Um, we all have this uh, place that, that we, in our head, that we see as Jerusalem. And, um, Bringing this project to Israel was really a double treat. One was telling a big story in my hometown, but then also bringing a production to uh, uh, my hometown and be being able to employ so many of the industry in Israel, which is a fantastic industry, small but fantastic. Is there anything in particular about Jerusalem that you're excited American audiences will learn or be surprised Well, I think it's, it's exactly the fact that we all have a preconceived notion of what this place is. Um, 
and when you grow up in Jerusalem, it's the, it's a you know it's a normal place. Um, you have the secular parts that are extremely modern and um, very high tech, uh, uh, and then there's the little bubbles of secret and you know um, more orthodox Jews and in, in, in the Arab neighborhoods where you find more of the history and the gravitas of the city. Um, I'm excited to bring it to the American screen because they really haven't seen Jerusalem as Jerusalem nowadays on the screen. We see it in biblical ways. We see it in, you know, uh, conquering Jerusalem or losing Jerusalem to the conqueror. But nowadays, uh, uh, Jerusalem is something we only see on the news if something horrible happens. We wanted to bring that tapestry of people and, and events to the American screen as they really are. So I'm really excited about that. From the script that we were able to read, uh, you introduced this idea of the red heifer very yes. quickly into the show. The first scene. <laughs> yes. Um, is there a when you're handling these sort of myths or beliefs that go yeah. that go deeply for some people? Is there a point of view in this show on them? Well, there's always a point of view, but we've really tried to we ask questions about faith and fanaticism, um, and I think those questions will will hopefully spark an interesting dialogue. Um, so when we show the birth of the red heifer, which means so much to many people, and it's not a myth, it's a, it's a prophecy that people really do believe in it. And if you Google it, you'll see that not only do they believe in it, every now and then they think they found the 10th red heifer. Um, and you see uh, a few years ago in Israel, they thought they found the red heifer, and uh, a bunch of buses and buses of, of uh, Christian pilgrims came to see this uh, little red cow who... Um, <laughs> who two years later, lucky for her, grew a thread of black hair and was disqualified <laughs> from being uh, uh, the red heifer. But So we, we, I think we're dealing with some subjects that are very sensitive to people. Anytime you, anytime you talk to about faith, it's, it's not even a rational sensitivity. It's just don't deal with that. But we dive right into it without judgment. Um, every one of our characters, the ones that our people are think are bad, the ones that people are going to think are good, are hopefully um, three-dimensional round characters that have their, um, you know, justification, even if it is faith. Mm. So. Well, the Peter and Lynn relationship seems to be very complex. What can you tease about the arc throughout the series? Well, what I love about this relationship is that it's a grown-up relationship. It's not a TV relationship. Um, it is... Uh, two people who don't want uh, to be together but find each other in each other's arms every now and then because um, they're very good friends and, and they work very well together but and, and they and they sometimes go to bed together but not in a romantic hope uh, uh, that this will end in marriage or something like that Peter is married and he's got an ex is a wife that he separated from but still married to and she was sorry <laughs> thank god that didn't happen on set uh, i didn't know this was on um and he's dealing with a very complex relationship there and and lynn is a woman who doesn't want this damaged man as her man she just wants to every now and then bed him <laughs> release some tension as it will yes. Yes. yeah yeah i mean it's two strong people who, who both damage it in their own way, who don't want love, but have needs. <laughs> and that gets complex, because as the series uh, uh, progresses, you see things that happen to both of them, and, and, and they need each other in ways that they hope they wouldn't. Can you talk about directing for this series? Because I hear you've directed like 75% of it. Well, I directed six out of the 10, and then and then also some stuff that was shot in Croatia for other episodes, yes. Um, for me, it wasn't such a big stretch from what I'm used to doing, because in Israel, I write and direct my whole show. So all 24 episodes of Prisoners of War were written and directed by me. But that's not the way it works in, in American television. So I was extremely happy, and it's very it's very much due to USA's trust and Tim's backing that they let me do episodes two and three. Um, and then they were very happy with the result and with what we got and with the speed in which we got it. And uh, they gave me more episodes, and and uh, it, it was it's a blessing. I, you know, see it's one thing to write it and then 
follow it to to the editing room but when you're the one actually there helping to give birth to the thing um, and working so closely with the actors and with the crew and it's it's uh, it's extraordinary it's what I love to do yeah. well can you talk a little bit about getting those extra episodes because that was a call that was made later in the run yeah of things so how did that kind of change your storytelling and make kind it of didn't adaptations because in terms of what? This adaptation you had to make to kind of have those extra hours now in a Well, it was just story. sleeping less. Um, honestly, mm -hmm. it was. Um, by then, we finished... When we went to Croatia, we shot... Uh, we block shot the, the first six episodes. So everything that happens outside in Jerusalem, um, we shot in Croatia. And I directed all of that, and the studio was very happy with what I got. Um, and then I, I came back here and directed episodes two and three. And by then, our writer's room was already done and Tim and I continued writing on our own um, and so you know when I'm really busy directing then Tim would go into the editing room and work on my episode and then when he's very busy I go in so it's it's really uh we support each other in that way um, and it's been yeah a privilege directing this much well the, the shows that you make and the yeah. Tim make are very different so when you work together what's that collaboration like bringing in two different styles. Well, I really it's it's been the best collaboration I've ever had. Um, he says the same thing. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> that's nice. Oh, he hates you, Gideon. What? Well, you say it was his first. <laughs> well, I, I um it it really has been a, a, the best collaboration of I've, I've ever had. It's a relationship that has no ego. Um, I don't even know if it's my idea or if it's Tim's idea. If it's the good idea, it goes into the script. Um, and we felt the same way about the writer's room that we assembled. It was really work just about dig. Um, all we cared about was the story and the characters. And the, and it's not that common in Hollywood um, that two people come together and, and uh, really uh, the project wins for it. Um, so. When you're really researching good. all these religious myths, whether they're myths or not, we're not sure, um, there's so many that you brought together. In yes. This. Uh, were there any really juicy ones you had to reject, and was it hard for you to say, oh, well, should we bring that element in, because that's interesting? Were there well, others that were just not quite fitting in, or well, there's there a were, lot of stuff out there? There is a lot of stuff out there. Um, and it, it was a blessing, because we could you know, pick and choose um, what we wanted at at the end of the day, it started to uh, a secret society started to form and a secret plan and a conspiracy started to form. And then a lot of cool stuff that we wanted to fit in just didn't fit in with that ideology anymore. Um, but that what that's There's what um, other seasons are for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what can you tell us at all about the red-haired woman? The red-haired woman? Yeah. <laughs> ah, this one. Yes. Yeah. He's talking about this one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I can tell you very little about her. Um, <laughs> when we first see her, it's when he's running through the market, and then she's there. And yeah. I thought it was almost like an homage to Run Lola Run, because she does all that running in the movie. Then you see she's and she disappears. There. Well, it's it's. Uh, I can tell you, it's not science fiction. It's not a, a, a supernatural thing. It's actually um, a woman that Peter uh, will meet in Jerusalem and will get obsessed with um, a little bit because of uh, uh, post-trauma, and in, in not post, of uh, trauma in his life that he's dealing with. <laughs> Red seems to be like a key color there. It Can is. you explain the symbolism you're trying to achieve with that? Well, we did, you know, um, Red plays a very big part of our show. Um, I don't want to go too detailed because it's going to sound like uh, film school, but um, <laughs> we do have a very specific color palette for every one of our worlds. Um, Norway. Uh, and the, the heifer story with Avram, which is a, really a story of, of uh, a boy and his pet, or a boy coming to discovering the world um, as he brings her to Jerusalem, um, is more greenish and white and, and uh, kind of cold. And we have the facility in Arizona, which we're going with blues uh, and grays. Um, and then we have the world in Jerusalem, which is very yellow and uh, noisy and claustrophobic and, and uh, uh, paranoid and, and dirty. All those word, worlds uh, share in common that we don't use red at all, but in very specific places. 
So red is a color that they all have, but very, very scarce. Very cool. <laughs> was that a key factor when you cast Lauren um, Ambrose? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, this is actually due to, I mean, of course, the, the script calls for it, but also S.J. Clarkson, who directed the pilot um, and brought this visual language to life. Um, and we're continuing what she's doing. Um, Lauren's casting had nothing to do with her hair, but with her amazing talent. <laughs> Well, could you also talk about a little about Ori Pfeiffer? Ori, yes. Um, he is really, a, I think, will be seen as a, as a breath of fresh air in American television. He is, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, but except to say what men used to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he's an Israeli, tough, macho, um, prickly on the outside, soft and, and gentle and smart on the inside. Um, He's very kind of uh, gruffy, is that a word? Mm -hmm. sure. Oh, good. It's a, is it a good word? <laughs> um, and he is exactly the opposite of Jason Isaac's character in terms of FBI agents do everything by the rules. They live by the rules. They have a code. They have a suit. They have button-down shirts. They have... Ori does... cares as much as Peter does about justice and about the truth, but he bends every rule to get there. Um, and that's why they clash, and that's why their bromance is so fascinating mm -hmm. um, and part of this show. Um, and we also, you know, it's Israeli men, I don't know how many of you met that kind of Israeli macho, it's, it's not me, <laughs> but it's, it's no, it's, um, the, it's a type, and it's a type that's very hard to get along with, and throwing Peter as a, a fish out of water into that world um, was fascinating to us. When did you know you wanted to be do this? To do what? Make make things. You know, well, I, I knew I always wanted always I wanted to tell stories. I started as a writer. I um I am a novelist in Israel, um, and then I went to um, acting school, but acting for directors. Um, and then I went to New York for a bit and, and took some courses at Stella Adler, also uh, uh, about directing. And it was, at the beginning, it was all about theater, mm -hmm. um, not so much film and television. Um, but it was all about telling stories in different ways. Yeah. Writing was uh, honestly a means to direct, because when, you, when you're trying to break into directing, the best way is to create your own material. And they say, I'll give it to you, but <laughs> I'm going to direct it. When you're, um, oh, I'm sorry. But but then it turned into, I mean, I'm very happy when I direct, and I'm very miserable when I don't write. I, that's the only reason. Interesting, thing. yeah. Okay. When you're writing a limited run, how aware are you of the fact that everyone binge watches now? Is that something that you Absolutely. Mentioned? It's like reading a book. And um, we even call Dig, uh, season one, we call it book one. Um, <laughs> but that's also because that's how I watch television. I don't have time to watch a lot of television. So when I have, you know, a weekend or something, I just take the recommendation that was given to me and, and watch the whole thing together. And it's so exciting because it's very sophisticated storytelling. You don't have to repeat yourself. Uh, the characters can actually have an arc because if you have an arc on a show that you don't know where it's going, you might have just killed the character's journey. Um, but these characters actually can have an arc. Just like it's like a long feature, basically, or a good book. Um, so it's you know it's uh, I think the best way to tell a story, and I think the whole industry is going into that mode. Um, when I moved to Los Angeles, um, or or I'd, I'd rephrase when when I turned Prisoners of War into Homeland, that's really the first time where the word franchise played any kind of, of uh, uh, had any kind of weight in my life. Because before that, when I was doing shows in Israel, the network would be like, well, how many episodes do you think it'll be? And I'm like, I don't know until the story dies. Like, we don't have the same kind of restrictions. Every, ep every season is 13 episodes, and we need for syndication this amount of episodes. And so it's really the story. Uh, you're allowed to tell the story at the story's length. Um, it was fascinating to then do Homeland and uh, shift the elements to get that engine that can continue going on. Um, but I think Dig is closer in its storytelling to Prisoners of War in the sense that the story ends. Mm -hmm. And then if we want to reinvent it in a different country, Peter can, you know, 
wake up in Istanbul and tell a different story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jason is really, um, seems to be carrying his part really well from what we've seen. Uh, what was the quality in him that you saw that said, he's my guy, he's, he's Peter? It was from the very first uh, inception of the idea. We were looking for a guy who is a leading man, but also has trauma behind his eyes, has depth, has age. Um, has life experience. We wanted the anti-TV hero. We wanted someone who is dark and yet still leading. Um, and we kept going back to Jason. And the first time we met Jason, this is after we have already discussed Jason, before the pilot was written, um, we met at our agent's house. There was some guest speaker and we all met there. And, and Tim and I went to Jason, this is a year before we went to him officially. And we said, by the way, we have a project, and we're thinking of you. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. And sure enough, uh, uh, a year later, he was ours. Um, and he's fantastic. He really is. He embodies Peter. And, and um, not only as an actor is he fantastic, but a lead actor really does set a tone on set. And um, Jason's energy and positivity and, and good mood all the time and endless, endless energy really do um, energize the set. He's like a generator. <laughs> and he has a boombox. Yeah. He has a boombox, which today he's not allowed to use. <laughs> oh, we all can't dance. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs>